so for those of you who haven't been here before, CG is an independent, nonpartisan think tank. What is a think tank, you ask? Well, what we do is we bring together the smartest people we can to work on some of the world's most pressing global public policy problems. Fake news, foreign interference in elections. I mean, there's, there is no bigger uh, problem of the day. Uh, so tonight, um, as part of, this, part of this better understanding of the electoral process, we're actually running a, a, our final pop-up voting, uh, um, I guess, what's it called? Uh, uh, Ryerson, Ryerson University's Democratic Engagement Exchange. So we've actually got a pop-up voting booth outside these doors, and you can go there and you can pretend to vote. You say, well, why would you pretend to vote? Well, what's interesting about this initiative is there's no candidates on it. There's only public policy issues, so you, you vote for the things that you actually think are important. And the purpose behind this is to demystify voting, because you know what we're what we're trying to do is encourage uh, voter turnout. As an, as a nonpartisan think tank, we don't care who you vote for, but it's just good to vote. It's good to participate in that democratic process. And so what will end up happening from this, the results from that um, from that pop-up uh, voting machine will actually be collected uh, and uh, distributed by PowerShift and made public in advance of the election. So, um, so that's one, one new thing that we're doing tonight. The second new thing we're doing tonight, for those of you who have been here before, is we recall we used to have microphones at the side of the auditorium. You, you'd come up and ask your question. My colleague Brian Atchison over there has something called a catch box. So there's actually a microphone embedded in that box. And so if you would like to ask a question of our speaker um, at, the end of the, at the end of the discussion, just put your hand up and one of our volunteers will come around and give you the catch box. Now, catch box might make you think also throw box. Please don't throw them. Just put your hand up and we'll collect them and take them around. Okay. Um, now, the other, uh, the other thing that is really important to us here at CG is uh, cultivating a strong relationship with Indigenous peoples, uh, the Indigenous peoples of Canada. So it's in the spirit of that commitment that we'd like to recognize the traditional territory of the, the Indigenous people uh, who called the land home before the arrival of the settlers. So CG acknowledges that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. CG is situated on the Haldeman Tract, which is the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. So, to our speaker, uh, Dr. Daryl Bricker uh, is quite a unique individual in Canada. Um, I mean, I've got his, his biography here in front of me and some of his highlights and accolades, but let's just say if I read them all, this would turn into a keynote speech and not an introduction. So I'll, I'll be fairly specific and as concise as I can be. Um, his real claim to fame is that he's actually a, C a, S a senior fellow here at CG and has been so since 2016. Uh, but he's really considered a strong and respected authority in Canadian and global polling research. He's also the chief executive officer for Ipsos Global, where he provides strategic marketing advice to clients uh, within the public, corporate, and not-for-profit sectors. Uh, and in his past role, Daryl actually worked within the Prime Minister's office as the director of public opinion research. So this stuff that we're going to be talking to about tonight is something that he knows well from both inside the political apparatus and outside in his polling research. He's well known globally as a public speaker who is frequently interviewed uh, in the media, appearing on networks such as CNN, the, BC, the BBC, Bloomberg, as well as all of Canada's major television and radio platforms. And I kid you not, this is not on my, introduct my introductory remarks, but I was reading the Globe and Mail before, um, before coming down, and actually Daryl was prepping in the office adjacent to mine, and he's featured on the Globe and Mail's website tonight on, uh, the, um, on your previous work. So he's, he's a well-respected uh, public uh, authority in his own right here in, in, in Canada. He's an active member of both the American Association for Public Opinion Research and Marketing Research and Intelligence Association, and he's the founding president uh, of the Canadian Association for Public Opinion Research. He earned his PhD in political science from, for, in political science from Carleton University and received an honorary doctor of laws from Wilfrid Laurier University. He was named as a social scientist and humanities research council doctoral fellow and was recognized in 2011 as one of Wilfrid Laurier uh, University's top 100 graduates in the last 100 years which is a feat in, in, its, own, in its own right. Uh, Daryl was further recognized by Carleton University in 2016 as one of their top 75 public affairs graduates in 75 years. I graduated from Carleton and I never got one of those. 
<laughs> so, uh, and again, as I said, uh, he's been awarded a Diamond Jubilee Medal by Canada's uh, Governor General, a commendation from the Admiral of the Navy. And again, if I went through this man's CV, we would be here all night. So suffice it to say, for the purpose of this, you're in good hands for tonight's discussion. Please w uh, help me in welcoming our speaker to the stage, Dr. Daryl Bricker. Thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be back at CG, uh, my, my home stomping ground. Uh, how many people went to Wilfrid Laurier University or are familiar with Wilfrid Laurier? Yeah, the main street of Wilfrid Laurier is called what? Bricker Street, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, around the time that they were granting that uh, land to the Six Nations, my f original forefathers were moving here on Conestoga wagons about the same time and uh, one of the original settler, settler families here in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, so I'm always very, very happy to be back here and, and at, a, at a very special institution at the Center uh, for International Governance Innovation. I mean, this, is a, this place is unique in Canada. There's really very few organizations that we have in this country that are like this. Uh, in the United States, where I spent a lot of time, or even in the UK, they have a lot of independent think tanks that really um, stimulate a lot of public conversation about the big issues facing not just the specific country that they're situated in, but also uh, global um, uh, issues. And uh, I think over a very short period of time, uh, CG has become one of those really valued institutions, not just in Canada, because as I said before, there's hardly any of them, uh, but really on a global stage. And I keep running increasingly into things that CG is doing all over the world. So um, this is a real gem that you have here in Kitchener-Waterloo, and uh, uh, I think it's great that they open it up to the public to come in and learn about some of the things that they're doing and even to share things like uh, I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, and for our grade 12 students, uh, I can remember sitting in rooms just like you guys were. I was at Glenview in, uh, in Cambridge, Ontario. Uh, so uh, um, it all, it's all uh, sort of a big, uh, 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 a mind-opening experience, hopefully for you. Uh, and uh, yes, you can do something with a political science degree after you graduate from university, and I'm <laughs> living proof for that. And I, as I would like to remind everyone, political science is the queen of the social sciences. <laughs> so if you want to major in political science, that's a good idea. So fake news and trust and information. Well, you know, we're in a little bit of an election campaign right now. And the interesting thing to me is the biggest story in the election campaign looked like it was fake news. When those pictures first appeared of our prime minister uh, deciding that he was going to uh, clothe himself in a certain way that... Uh, I guess back then didn't seem like it was such a big idea, but it certainly seems like such a big idea now. Normally, when you see a picture like that come up in the news, if I was you know, looking at it as an observer of public opinion uh, or following politics, I would look at it and I would automatically say, this has got to be real. If this was 25 years ago, I would absolutely assume it was real. Today, my first question is, is it fake news? Did somebody manufacture this? Is this really true? You can't trust what you see with your own eyes anymore. You can't trust what you read. You can't trust what you experience because there are people out there trying to manipulate your experience all the time. So when we look at um, this topic of news, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about trust in the news. Who do we trust? Where do we get the information that we find most important when we're trying to determine what's going on in the world? Where do we think fake news comes from? Attitudes toward fake news, what do we think about it? And then finally, I did a really interesting piece for the uh, Radio and Television News Directors Association here in Canada. Uh, we actually ran a test among Canadians as to who could spot fake news. And I'll tell you how Canadians did. So sources of news consumption, where do we get uh, most of our news? Most Canadians, almost half of us, say we get most of our news from local news sources. We're very interested, one of the things that's really happened in Canadian society is, as the world has become more available, in some ways we've become more insulated. Uh, things that are most important to people these days are the things that happen right outside of their front door. They're almost overwhelmed by all of the things that are happening. So it's interesting that local news seems to be important for people, finding out what's going around, uh, on around, uh, in, their, in their own communities, which is ironic given how uh, much difficulty local newspapers are in these days. So it's, there's still a demand for finding out what's going on in your community, but maybe the format that it's presented in and how we access it is changing. 
Next after that, national news sources, so we care about what's happening directly around us, then what's happening in our country, and then after that, international news sources. Where, what have we accessed in the, over the space of the last month in order to be able to understand those three things? What's going on in our community, what's going on in our country, and then what's going on around the world? Well, primarily, when you take a look at where we get most of our news, or at least we say we get most of our news, it comes mostly from traditional news sources. So we get it from broadcast TV news. I don't know that everybody watches a nightly news broadcast, but if uh, Canadians congregate around one thing these days in order to find out what's going on uh, around them, it tends to still be television, believe it or not. Following that, Facebook. Now I know that's mom book to a lot of uh, younger people, but uh, still, Facebook is ubiquitous out there, not just as a source of information in the sense of people talking to each other about what's going on in their uh, individual lives, but things that are posted there uh, tend to represent an important source of news. People get a lot of their information off of that form of social media. Followed by print newspapers, news radio, social media generally, cable news, newspaper websites, you can go down the list. Now if I had put this list up 15 years ago, there would be no Facebook. There would be no social media we would still mostly be concentrating on the traditional sources of media. So when you talk about distribution and how people get access to information, it's a combination of more traditional news sites, but also these, news, these new places emerging that they find uh, information from, or they discover information. And that's really how you should look at this. If I'm gonna discover something going on, where am I gonna discover it? It's probably in these places. International perceptions of living in the internet bubble. I love this. This comes from a study that we do at uh, Ipsos called Perils of Perception. We, I think we did it in, uh, in uh, this one in 28 countries. But the average person in my country lives in their own bubble on the internet, mostly connecting with people like themselves, looking for opinions they already agree with. In fact, uh, worldwide, 65% of us think that that's the case. In Canada, we think it's, what is it, 69 here? In the United States, it's 77. But then we ask people if they in fact do it themselves. No, it's a, it's a much smaller number. So it's everybody but me does this. I'm open-minded. I, I read everything. Well, no, apparently not. People are lo looking at you don't believe that that's the case. We believe that we're narrow. We believe that we don't actually watch what's, uh, we w look at what's happening in the broad world. Uh, it's like uh, they used to say about Ad Adolf Hitler. Um, you know, he read widely everything that agreed with him. Trust in the news. How much do we trust? We trust a lot. So, I trust a great deal or fair amount traditional news media in Canada. It's, uh, what is it here? You can add up the number. It's 57 plus 12, so uh, 60, uh, 69. You like how I did that? That's my math skills. Um, being applied here, 69%. I, I should tell you that right now, Justin Trudeau's trust is 36. Donald Trump's is 42. <laughs> See, all I have to say is Donald Trump and I get the, I'll wake up the audience. <laughs> Welcome aboard, folks. It's a and who's trusting? Canadians between the ages of 35 and 54 and mostly Canadians 55 years of age or plus, people uh, 55 years or older, uh, age of years of age or older, and uh, the reason for that is they're probably more familiar with a lot of um, a lot of the uh, the media that we still uh, that we still access, but also they tend to be more trusting. It's the younger folks who don't trust anybody as much as they used to, or previous generations used to, uh, and when we look at specific sources that we trust. Again, kind of replicating what we talked about before. Broadcast television news, highest level of trust, followed by print newspaper and news radio, traditional news, cable news after that, newspaper websites. There's something that I call a digital discount. And the digital discount is, even if you, it is reported by and pushed out by, say for example, the Globe and Mail, the likelihood that you're going to believe it if you read it online versus if you read it in the newspaper is lower by how much here? 
So there's a credibility gap still with even the mechanism for delivering the same news. If it's online, I'm less likely to believe it. Talk radio, 40%. Online only news publications, compare that to a newspaper, it's half, less than half. And you can just go down the list here. It's amazing that so few people trust Facebook, but so many people use it. Twitter, 10%. How many people actually tweet? This is what I mean. I, I get these people who come out and say, hey, I can, can predict the election outcome based on what people say on Twitter. No, you can't. It's hardly anybody <laughs> uses Twitter. It's, it's basically uh, uh, you know, a, a site for journalists talking about things and people who are hyper-interested in public policy. It's not representative of what Canadian public opinion is at all. And as you can see from this, hardly anybody trusts it to one in 10. But who shares the information on any of these platforms has a big impact. So, if it comes from a traditional media company, I'm much more trusting. And the one that's the most troubling about all of this is your friends and family. Almost at the same level as a traditional media outlet. So if your brother or your sister sends you a story that happens to be fake news, it automatically escalates in terms of its impact on you and the level of trust that you have associated with it. So stop sending around those fake news stories, people. Uh, you might think it's like Russian bots that are causing all of this. Just as much, the distribution mechanism is actually us. And we don't believe political leaders, celebrities, or a sponsored post. Uh, traditional news sources and friends and family. Impact of uh, social media in Canada, so is it a good thing or a bad thing? In terms of access to information, it's a pretty good thing. Makes communications easy, easy. gives us some freedom of, of expression, doesn't do anything for our public institutions, doesn't really make them any more accountable. Uh, mixed impact, has it made us more civil? No, nah, we're really not sure. And uh, what about civility online? No, nah, not so great. What's really negative? It's worsened our personal privacy. This is a really cool piece of work that uh, CG has done, is on the area of privacy and internet governance. And one of the things that's really interesting that I've seen in my own professional career over the space of the last, uh, I'd say, 15 years, is how the capability of technology that's so easily globalized is now becoming nationalized. And this is one of the big drivers of that. So for example, the idea that you can have what I call a follow, well, I, not me, but technologists call a follow the sun IT strategy in any company where, you know, depending on who happens to be up at any particular time, they're gonna have access to all the servers regardless of where they are, like this idea of one big na international network. No, 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 no. Decreasingly possible. Because countries are increasingly exercising uh, um, control over access to the data of their citizens. For good reason, for good reason. So that big globalized international um, internet dream is starting to decline as countries take more and more control over what's going on because of a desire to protect personal privacy and also security. I'm just uh, gonna be releasing a survey at something called the Halifax International Security Forum in, uh, in uh, November in which all the big security people from around the world get together. It's kind of like Davos for generals and admirals. And uh, single biggest threat to the world today in the minds of people around the world, 28 countries, getting hacked. Even more than being attacked by another country, getting hacked. It's, what else is bad with it? It distracts our daily life. I mean, you guys are probably getting itchy because you can't access your, your, uh, your mobile phones can't find out what's going on and I don't know whatever platform we happen to be on. It's a big distraction in your day-to-day -day life. It tends to polarize politics. I think that's absolutely the case. Uh, if you look at one of the big drivers of what I would call tribalism in the United States or in the UK around the issue of Brexit was definitely social media. Allows for foreign meddling in po politics and also increases the likelihood that we will need censorship. So sources of fake news, where does it come from? Well, if I've seen fake news, and this is just Canadians, by the way, 
This is the percentage of Canadians who say that they've seen fake news by the following sources. And you'll notice that um, on the previous slides that I was showing you where people get their information, Facebook's pretty high up, and then you get into the various social media sites, but traditional media, site, tr traditional media is very high on the chart. But where do people spot their fake news? On the ones that are lower on the chart. And they mostly, re mostly relate, actually almost exclusively relate to online sources. So where does fake news come from? Most of the world thinks it comes mostly from the United States. <laughs> not Russia, not China, not India, although they're on the, uh, on the chart here, but mostly from the United States, including 59% of Canadians. So where does fake news come from in the world? The U.S. Attitudes about fake news. My ability to spot fake news, my confidence in being able to spot fake news, 81% of us say that we're confident that we can spot it. Especially among men, what a shock and university graduates, those people who we've given Shakespeare, uh, Shakes, uh, sh sheepskin to and told, uh, told them they're smart. They believe this. We can spot fake news. And looking at this internationally, confidence in identifying fake news, I can, I'm confident that the average person in my country can tell real news from fake news. Worldwide, 41% say we can. United, in Canada, only 39% of us say that we think people can tell the difference between fake news and us. Remember, 81% of us are confident that we can. So everybody else is dumb, but I'm smart. And in the United States, it's only 29. Now, we asked a slightly different question on this because uh, it's a different survey, and the number dro drops down to 63, uh, or what is it, 64 for Canada, saying that they're confident to spot, spot fake news, but still a really high number. And again, uh, people around the world think that they're capable of doing it, and especially Americans. And not only that, we think we're better at spotting fake news than the average person in my country. Canada, 54%. United States, 65%. So we think we're really good at this. Uh, but we still get burned. 65% of Canadians say that they've actually, at least for a short period of time, falsely believed a fake news story. I can spot it, but I get caught. And interestingly, it tends to be people with lower levels of education and younger Canadians who seem to be more honest about this. This is an interesting question for me. If I disagree with a story, it's likely fake news. Thankfully, only a quarter of us think that. But still a quarter, like one in four of every one of the people in this room. You can look side to side. I mean, <laughs> they usually sit in the aisle seats. I just uh, so. <laughs> I'm pointing at Walter McLean over here. That's a. And who's most likely to believe that if they disagree with a fake news story that uh, 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 it's well, it's men again, and those who are slightly less educated. So let's put Canadians to the test, and I'll just give you the scores right away so you know what we're doing. So what we did was we actually went out and we ran, we took six fake news stories, uh, actually a couple of true ones and a, and a few fake ones, and asked people to pick whether or not they were fake or real. In Canada, only 37% of us can actually pick out consistently fake news. Only 37% of us. 63% of us failed. Here were the stories, I'll, I can't really read them up here, most of them were American, but as you can see on almost every single story, at least half the people got it wrong. So the interesting thing that I found uh, in this test is there was absolutely no correlation between people who were capable of picking out fake news and those who were actually successful in doing it. So your level of confidence had no relationship to your ability to perform. Your level of education had no relationship to your ability to be able to spot fake news. 
So the overeducated men who think they're really good at this, not so much. Not so much. But the real problem in all of this, and this is going to be my last slide, is the impact of fake news on Canada. And it's really the top bar that is the most concerning. What it does is it deteriorates our trust in media. And if we're relying on media to get information about what's going on in our communities, what's going on in our country, and what's going on in the world, that's a really, really troubling finding. At this time in which we're going through our biggest democratic challenge, our national election, and this is the situation that we're finding ourselves in when we're starting to question an awful lot of stuff, and we're not really capable in many instances of even addressing the question of whether or not we're uh, confident in being able and successful in being able to, be, to pick out fake and real news stories, it sets up an opportunity for some really disruptive, potentially disruptive activities within the context of an election campaign. So anyway, I look forward to your questions. Aaron's going to lead us through a little conversation here. Thank you very much. See, I told you, uh, a, gr a great speaker and, and really thoughtful. And I've got a couple of questions, but we also definitely want to keep this open and we want to make it a dialogue with the audience. So if you do have a question, feel free to put your hand up I'll, and I'll kick things off because as, as you were talking, I started to think about the platforms, right? Because you, you started with Facebook and Twitter and, and a lot of people viewing the content on them as being a source of fake news. And so maybe think about content moderation. And so is there a way to get platforms to do a better job and to, to censor the type of inform information that goes across those networks so that they're responsible for picking off fake news so that we can kind of get to the root of this? Well, you know, there, there have been efforts, and I mean, most of them have been voluntary on behalf of many, uh, some of the bigger social media platforms where they've, uh, they've uh, started to look at the content and take some responsibility for what they do. But it's kind of antithetical to what their, um, their foundational argument is, right? Which is, it's going to be everything available to everybody. I can connect with everybody. Uh, it's, you know, I'm going to create a more connected world where everybody can be open and talking. I mean, it's basically what Facebook... That, that, that's the raison d'etre, right? And this is what they w what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, so now they're being asked to change that. Uh, and there's a certain amount of resistance to, to making those changes for, for a couple of reasons. One, it's, sort of, it's, it's antithetical to what the purpose was supposed to be because everybody was supposed to go on and behave badly or well. Instead, a few people have decided to behave badly. And the second thing is, who can moderate? So particularly in the United States right now where you have such a tribal situation in which Democrats and Republicans can't even talk to each other. They can't even agree these days on what's a fact. They can't even agree on what's a fact. Who's going to be the, the, the credible source of uh, decision on moderating the information that goes on social media? What is a fact? I mean, you know, uh, I remember when I uh, was, was in graduate school and I took a course on uh, public policy and, and it was actually more about philosophy than it was public policy. And uh, the, the professor uh, talked about what he called the fact value distinction. You know, the idea that there are facts and there are values. And by the end of it, you got, came to the conclusion that, uh, you know, particularly if you were more into Nietzsche and nihilism or whatever, that, uh, that uh, facts were just the values that you were prepared to accept, right? You know, there, it, it was really just a, 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 an expression of what you thought uh, was important and factual. So when we're in a world like that, in which there's there even science is questioned, like on climate change, for, for example, these days, where people feel that they can, uh, they can question you know, huge amounts of consensus science because it's not factual in their, in their point of view, it makes it very difficult to have that judge or that arbiter sitting there saying, this is, this is you know, factual and this isn't factual. So I don't know how they're going to pull that one off. Maybe they can put it on Mechanical Turk and then get... Uh, 500 people to sort it out or something like that, I don't know. Um, maybe these ki the, the grade 12 is up front if you guys are looking for a summer job. Um, no, I mean, th there's that old axiom, right, that says you're entitled to your own opinion but not your own facts, and we're starting to see that kind of change now. What is a fact? Yeah. Um, well, you know, when if, if, if we kind of get to the position where it's going to be a little bit too hard 
uh, for social media companies to, um, to deal with all the content moderation. One kind of quickly comes to self-censorship, and you talked about, you know, you get a piece of, of information from your brother, you're more likely to trust it. Well, what, what onus is, is there on individuals, right? Because in a, in a liberal democracy, the government certainly can't police what people say. It doesn't work that way. It's a freedom of expression and speech is an enshrined fundamental right. But is there something that we can be doing to censor ourselves a little bit more? Because that, I mean, for, take it from me, right? That click button where you can share stuff is so close. I, so you guys are all going to think, I'm going to tell you the story. It's a bit embarrassing. I'll tell you the story anyway. Um, I, I woke up uh, one morning and I saw that, the, uh, that Justin Trudeau had successfully negotiated to bring the headquarters of the United Nations to Toronto. And I thought this was amazing. Can I do global governance? I was so excited for like, Five seconds, because then I realized it was an April Fool's Day. But I was for for a moment it even got me, and that that share button is just so close. And so, is there anything we can do to encourage self censorship? Well, I I, I, w I would say that uh, you know improve the levels of education and make <laughs> people smarter. But there's really no correlation between levels of education and willingness to do that sort of thing. I don't think there's really any um, uh, there's any easy answer on this. I think that maybe what we need to talk about is when this matters. I mean, so uh, uh, like, for example, the case that you raised, uh, you know, it's you know, personally embarrassing for you, but I don't, uh, I, I don't think that that does any you know, un undue damage. The problem is when you get into something like, for example, a, a, an election campaign, and you have foreign governments uh, seeding the clouds with all of this fake information, just making stuff up with no responsibility. And because it's titillating and interesting, people share it. And it, it almost becomes like a virus. It's, it starts to infect the body politic. Uh, and those are the things that are really, truly dangerous. Um, and I don't know, um, you know from, a, from the perspective of security agencies that uh, the, 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 the line that you can draw to prevent that kind of thing happening. But uh, that's, what, that's what the new reality of, uh, of, uh, of uh, having ubiquitous access to the internet and particularly to social media. It's been, it's wep been weaponized by, by people with political agendas and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, I it's potentially incredibly dangerous. Now, maybe that goes to the idea of targeted ads then too, right? Is, th is that also part of the problem? The fact that, you know, if you were to, to in traditional media, if you were to take out an advertisement in say the Globe and Mail, it's the same advertisement for him as it is for her, as it is for him. Everyone sees the same ad, but with the amount of personal data that the media, social media companies now have, they can target those ads. So they understand your preferences, they understand um, your user behavior, and then they can make an individual cocktail just for you, and they can sell that. Um, and so are we, are we witnessing something that's fundamentally different? And, I, and is that part of the issue when uh, foreign adversaries then try and weaponize these platforms because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a tailor-made ad just to provoke a response for you specifically? Yeah, I mean, it's clearly there's a, you know, I don't, you guys may have watched it on Netflix. It's a, a documentary called The Great Hack. Maybe you haven't seen it, and it's, it's really quite disturbing about what happened at Cambridge Analytica. Um, which some of you may have heard about uh, uh, through, uh, through the, the particularly the Brexit and the U.S. elections. Um, and uh, you know, it's quite disturbing the level of information that they have and how that can be, as I said before, weaponized for the purposes of pushing a political agenda. Um, the, uh, th the truth is that it's really difficult to kind of determine what part of this is, is good and what part of it is bad. So there's a lot of what you said that sounds really bad that actually can be potentially really good. Like if consumer companies figure out exactly what you want and they can give you exactly what you need at the best possible price that you can get it and they can give it to you with easy access, that might actually be a really good thing and we might like that. Um, that uh, you're able to uh, t tailor so many different things and make uh, the friction of being a consumer less and more rewarding, it's probably something that we would all support. But it's the same mechanisms that are used for that that are also used for that other thing. 
that you were talking about. Yeah, and we had had a bit of a conversation over dinner, and in, in, in the, the 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 big example is the American election in 2016, where social media was effectively weaponized. But you know, I'd said, and I'd, I'd heard this somewhere else, so I don't take credit for it. But it's not as though the Russians invented racism or the Russians invented sexism. They simply knew to to push on on that on those types of buttons. So is there? Is is the is the real problem that we have a divisive society? Well, I mean, the, we can get into a whole conversation about populism. Maybe we will. We'll see where the questions go. Um, but uh, cult cultural change is the thing that drives pop populism, uh, and uh, the sense that the world is moving in a direction that people don't like and they feel like they're out of control has caused them to uh, come up with um, uh, political solutions that. Uh, we, we haven't seen as being popular since probably the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a troubling time that we live in. Uh, but uh, the, uh, th there's, it's, it's one thing when it's kind of domestically uh, created. It's quite another thing when somebody, s when a foreign government comes in and decides to do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I didn't tell you this at dinner when we were talking about this, but we do a lot of work in this area, uh, looking at things like, for example, we're looking at bots in the Canadian election. So there's different types of bots. These are sort of robotized methods for spreading information uh, that uh, can legitimately be used. So news organizations have them. They, you know, pump out their stories. Uh, political parties have them. They pump out their information. But also uh, people like um, security agencies in other countries can have their own versions of that, and they can also pump out information. So in Canada right now, the bot traffic of all of the traffic that's taking place on the publicly available internet, uh, so in any social media platform, about 5% of it is produced by bots. In the United States, and I'll take a specific issue that I know, that I, I know well, and that's the Colin Kaepernick issue, and you guys probably remember this, uh, uh, San Francisco's 49ers uh, quarterback, who was the first guy to start taking a knee during the national anthem. When that started and created so much of a firestorm in the United States, 15% of the online traffic conversation that was taking place was generated by bots. Um, the, the United States is the place that this stuff happens. And, and we can even figure out where they're coming from. Like it's, it's 9 a.m. In, in, in St. Petersburg and that's where this URL goes to. I mean, you can, you can actually figure out where this stuff comes from. It takes some work, but you can figure it out. So foreign um, um, powers are using the divisiveness of the United States right now, the topic that you were talking about, mm -hmm. to exacerbate or create even greater friction. And, and we're now in a period of, uh, in which politics is becoming much more tribal. Mm -hmm. Not as strongly in Canada, but certainly in places like Western Europe. Certainly the United States is probably the best example of it, where Democrats and Republicans can't even talk to each other anymore. Um, and uh, if you're somebody who knows how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, throw salt on those wounds, you can be very disruptive in a political campaign. Yeah, no, I take your point. You couldn't pass a non-binding resolution uh, in the House right now that apple pie tastes good and, and baseball is a, good, is, a, is, a, is a fun sport um, because it's just so, it's just so divisive. Um, and so, well, you know, what, what, when one of the things you'd said was uh, was not lost on me um, that you know the most likely people to fall for manipulated content are uh, well-educated, confident men, and that so well-educated, confident men are the most likely to fail. Something my wife tells me routinely. So I, uh, um, but let me you know. But in all seriousness, let me ask you this: Why do you think so many people fall for this? Like. You know, because when I was when I was looking at it, it it is hard to distinguish. Is that what it, is that what it is? Is that some of the stuff is just that close to the line that you can believe? Oh, the the people who are really good at this, we live in, an, uh, are the ones who know how to manipulate behavior, okay, and and understand behavioral science. One of the most fascinating areas of marketing these days, and actually from politics through to consumer marketing, is the whole area of behavioral science. How people think, how they deliberate, how they how they make decisions. And there's been a couple of Nobel Prizes awarded based on this, and except they call it behavioral economics. And you know, Don Daniel Kahneman's book, a book you should all pick up and read because it's a good book, uh, it called Thinking Fast and Slow is really how that the is world a good book actually yeah. is really how the world works. And um, I, I actually, Jonathan Haidt uh, wrote another book on 
this. I can't remember exactly what the topic was. I actually agree with his version of things more than I agree with Kahneman's version. So Ka Kahneman basically says there's two types that your brain operates in two ways. Uh, it thinks fast and it thinks slow. So whenever you are, and it's based on biology, it's, you know, our, we're naturally wired for fight or flight or fight. Uh, and uh, therefore, the, the way that we're most comfortable making decisions is based on our emotions. So we don't think quickly about things, we respond to them. So it's just like imagine you're, you're dealing with uh, a person that you meet th who just walks into the room, maybe sitting beside you today. You don't know what you think about them, but you do. We have what we, we call heuristics or rules of thumb, these really fast ways of making decisions that are hardwired into our emotional decision-making flight or fight system where we decide immediately about stuff. And then he says, well, there's another system too, they call it, which is more deliberative type uh, uh, decisions in which the decision is not so easy. We tend to be more deliberative. We, we try to think things through. We're not as emotionally committed to it maybe, so we, 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 we tend to think through and we tend to learn. I actually like what Jonathan Haidt says about it, which is system two is really the uh, excuse we use to justify system one. Mm. In other words, every decision that we make is basically emotional and we like to think we're more deliberative, so we made up this <laughs> Kahneman's made up this other reason for, for actually emotional decisions, and, and, and I actually think hate is right. So what does this mean? Well, it means that what happens is we get triggered. We get signaled. Uh, people who are good at this know, know how to um, uh, um, work into that emotional uh, aspect of how we make decisions to trigger us into a fast decision. So what happens with people even well-educated people, is that when they get this information, if it's designed properly to trigger their emotional reaction, it has a deep impact. And that's why you do it. Mm -hmm. You are really interested in international affairs. You really think it's a great idea that the UN moves to Toronto. This appeals to your emotional reaction rather than your reasonable reaction. So you're, you're about to send it back out, right? Because now I found something that's interesting. I've been triggered to do this. Now, you step back for a second, maybe kicking in systems too, saying, how can this be possible? This is, oh, it's April Fool's? Okay, well, fine, okay, make a different decision. But the people who are really good at manipulating this are the people who focus on emotional responses. And because the world is so overwhelming these days, so overwhelming, one of the things that, uh, that we look at in, in Canada, that's, uh, and we've looked at it worldwide too, worldwide too uh, and, and that's 80% of the people feel overwhelmed with information today completely overwhelmed with information. So the way you work your way through that is through your heuristics. You think fast based on your emotions, which is ideally set up for exactly the situation that those you know, you know, bot moles in, uh, in St. Petersburg are gonna take advantage of, or in North Korea or wherever. So that's why it's dangerous. Um, I wanna turn to the audience. Who wants to try out our fancy new microphone box? Right down here, perfect. Did everyone, did everyone hear that question? Yeah, no, we, so could you just repeat that one, I guess speak closer to the box? Yeah, it's, it's gonna be a very confusing place and I think what's gonna happen is people are gonna start manufacturing their own versions of what is a trusted network. You guys already do it. I mean, you know who your influencers are, you know who you follow, you know where you can get information that you, can where you feel you can trust is from. So what's gonna end up happening is probably gonna be a combination of greater individual curation of what the media mix is gonna look like, but you're also gonna go to people who are gonna curate it for you. It's almost, it'll almost be like uh, s you know, when you go on Spotify, somebody whose playlist you really like. I think that's probably gonna start happening in the world of, uh, of, of information. And, and we're, you guys are already doing it. Many people here, are, you like certain podcasts. I mean, you listen to those. You, you construct your own version of reality, even though we say that we don't live in our own little bubbles. We're gonna be creating those things, which, a bit of a problem. Because it, it's how you deal with being overwhelmed. You build walls. Sure, yeah, we have another question over here. Please, yes, sir. Uh, we're in the middle of a, an election campaign, just a few weeks to go. What? I'd Nobody heard. Told me. Yeah. Nobody told me. <laughs> Uh, wondering 
you know, maybe four or five days out from, the, from election day, some very effective fake ad comes out, something about Mr. Scheer, Mr. Trudeau, maybe one of the other party leaders. I have to imagine that, it, that the Liberals and Conservatives, at least, if not the other parties, have a team in place who worry about this and who think about this. How do you respond to it? Because these things go viral so quickly. And they probably talk to people like you to say, what do we do? So what do they do if something like this comes out, especially if it's very effective and perhaps very close to voting day? I put my phone on call forward to Barry Kay and I sent it over to him. He, he gets to answer it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, yes, they do. But you would be, uh, anybody, has anybody worked on like the nas in a national office of a national political campaign ever in this room? No. You would be depressed. Our national political campaigns take place in this instance, was it 36 days? Over in the blink of an eye, all staffed by volunteers. Uh, we restrict the amount of money that you can raise and restrict the amount of money that you can spend. These are not incredibly professional operations. I'm sure that they've got some smart guys at PC party or uh, CPC party headquarters who are, um, say that they can do this, and I'm sure that the Liberals have something similar. But in comparison to the people who would be trying to make this happen, they're amateurs. They're amateurs. Uh, I would expect the way that it probably would be dealt with is it would be trumped by more credible sources, which would be the more traditional media. So, uh, for example, when the, um, uh, the second story came out about Justin Trudeau and blackface, the Conservative Party had it, but it didn't release it. It gave it to Global News, and there's a, a new service that they have or an agreement that they have among the news sources or the news organizations today where they do like a truth verification process to certify that something's actually true. And it was actually Global News that broke it. So I think probably what would happen is if something came out that was truly fake and impactful, then that would be a, the kind of process that we would go through, that the, main, the, the more traditional media would kind of gang up to, to, to speak it down. But, you know, that takes time. If it's the last two days of the campaign, it might have an impact. There's also a mechanism set up um, within our government, not the political level of the government, but the bureaucratic level of government. So if there's a concern of foreign interference or meddling in the election, and this team set up within the civil service, who are professional, they, li they, they serve the government no matter who's in power, liberal, conservative, NDP, whatever, it doesn't matter to them. They're, they're an apolitical body. And there's uh, very senior civil servants that are set up. So if there's an issue with respect to the integrity of the election, they will actually step in and they're empowered to deal with that as well in a totally non-political way. Yeah, it'll, um, it'll take them six years and <laughs> nobody will believe anything that they have to say. It's like the Thundercats. I mean, they're going to come in and take care. No, it's, it's, it's just... And you guys have no idea what a Thundercat is. And as if the Laurentian elite public servants who live in Ottawa and never go outside of that city are actually independent arbiters of any of this as they stood up and applauded for Justin Trudeau as he walked in on his first day at the uh, Pearson Building in Foreign Affairs. Yeah, not really credible. Well, tell us what you really think. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I just, <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that that would be the reaction of anybody who didn't happen to be a liberal. Yeah. Right? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, my question uh, concerns the voting when we come in this evening, and it's the perception uh, that I was concerned about about what is limiting the, the political perspective of what's important or what isn't. And I noticed among the, the choices in the balloting, two or, two or three were actually left out, uh, federal debt and deficit and immigration. And I was really curious of why they were not included. Uh, Daryl didn't staff the voting booth. Uh, so it's his fault. Yeah, you know what? I, that's a that's a that's a fair question to which I don't I don't have a ready answer. But why don't we agree to meet uh, at the the side afterward, and I'll bring in somebody who actually knows about who who designed those questions, and we can uh, we can look into it for you because it's a, it's a fair point. I actually just have no idea. Oh, the people who designed it have their hands up. I should also say, you know, that one issue that generates a disproportionate amount of bot traffic, and. Um, social media conversation today <laughs> is immigration. I'm just gonna go. Immigration is a very, very hot topic that none of the political parties other than Maxime Bernier and the, and the People's Party are actually talking about. And maybe we'll hear some of it on Monday night. Um, mm -hmm. 
during the English language debate. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so on the vote pop-ups, um, my name's Haley. I work locally for a nonprofit called the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, and we've been the people facilitating vote pop-ups across the region. So we have about 15 local partners, CG, the libraries, um, some school boards, things like that involved. And so we had like a preliminary vote with those initial partners to vote on what should be on a common ballot. So those were the issues that our 15 initial partners thought um, should go on a common ballot. So that's why they're there. That's also why there's a space that says other. So you can write in those issues that matter to you if, we, if they weren't represented on that common ballot. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I understand your point. So when we go out and we ask people, what are the most important issues facing Canada during this election? Uh, th the top five are healthcare is number one by a pretty wide margin. Number two uh, this week, but it wasn't last week, was climate change. Number three was affordability. Number four was taxes. So we start getting into deficit. Actually, number eight was immigration. Uh, I bet if I go over and I take a look at that list, that most of the ones that they have on that list are probably at the bottom of the, because <laughs> these are what, you know, these organizations are interested in. But yeah, I mean, we, we ask all the time, I can tell you exactly what the issues are that people uh, are thinking about in this campaign. Yeah, and another, you know, another good example that you don't typically hear about in, uh, in an election campaign, and I don't even know what's on that list, but foreign policy or the conduct of foreign affairs, obviously it's something I'm deeply interested in, but no one wants to talk about it during an election campaign because they want to talk about pocketbook issues, right? It's not, it's not something that traditionally politicians view as something that'll get votes, so it's left off, or at least if it's a plank of a party, it's a, it's a very uh, small plank and it's not something that takes up a lot of space, though it's one of the most important things. I mean, look at Department of National Defense's budget, Department of Foreign Affairs to bu budget, uh, our development agency's budget, those are all the way Canada projects itself into the world, but yet it's something we don't necessarily talk about. So uh, the answer to that is, uh, is one of these things where people just don't see them as vote getters and so they don't, they don't generate uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of votes. People want to talk about pocketbook issues. We had another question up here? Was there? Oh, please, yeah. Well, I, I don't think I don't think that we can roll the clock back on that. I mean, maybe some individual families can and, and households can. But you know, the interesting thing is that uh, even based on the statistics here, the people who are the most fooled and the people who are having the biggest problems are actually not the kids; they're the older people. Uh, because I think that the younger generation tends to be better educated. Um, uh, absolutely true. Every way that you can measure it, more literate more worldly than the generations that preceded them. So they, um, uh, I think that rather than looking at it as what can we do to make them better, I think maybe we should maybe turn it on its head and ask ourselves what can we learn from what they're doing that can help make everybody else better. Because I think that there's a healthy level of skepticism among the younger generations because they're not as gullible in some ways because they've seen a lot of this. And when you take a look at the United States and you do look at the tribes that are, that are emerging, the ones that are the most problematic right now are the ones that are the most appealing to the older generations. So, you know, Donald Trump's average voter was not 18 years old, didn't have a university education, and didn't live in a place like if it was here in Canada, in a pla place like Waterloo, Ontario. That's not, that's not who's voting for, for guys like Donald Trump. Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, th th there's another conversation to have. But uh, in, in terms of social media, I think uh, the younger generations are, uh, there's some catching up that older people have to do in order to learn their, uh, I would say, um, uh, I guess, discriminating 
views of what they look at. The, I mean, the wonderful thing about, about social media is there's no such thing as, uh, as, as, as barriers or boundaries. And it's also the terrifying thing about social media. So, you know, it's like Doctor Who. I don't know, if anybody watch Doctor Who? I watch Doctor Who. You know, he's everywhere always. And that's exactly what it is for, for social media. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, when we used to think about our mental space, our mental space was our community, right? We had a hometown. I mean, there's people who are sitting here in this room, and particularly at this, this group here, that have people that they would consider to be very good friends, very, very good friends, probably better friends than even the people who are living down the street or next door or in class with them that they have never met. Is that true? Show of hands? Y yeah? <laughs> See? We have right? a because, yeah. because, the, because for them, the world truly is global. There's no, there's no boundaries or barriers. I mean, you can be listening to K-pop this afternoon. You can listen to Billie Eilish you know, uh, tomorrow. You can, you, can, you can plug into some anime thing that's going on. Like, my daughter's very into anime. I mean, all of her friends, I mean, she's up all night long because she's talking to people in Japan she's never met. And she considers these her friends and the people down the street she could care less about. So there's, there's a, it's, it's just this really interesting juxtaposition of how younger people look at physical space, their presence in the physical space, how they look at um, uh, their, uh, w how they develop their loyalties about various things, how they shop, how they consume, how they do everything. It's very, very different than the older generations. Now the older generations are coming along because I bet you everybody in this room who's over the age of 50 has ordered something on Amazon and had it delivered to their house. You may have used Skip the Dishes, you may have did, I mean, all, all of the, the, the technologically enabled things that make your life easier, everybody in this room is accessing. These guys are just getting there first. So if I have any hope, it's actually that the younger folks will figure this out. And that's not an abdication of responsibility. I think older folks who've been through some of these things before, who've seen what the political ramifications of some of these problems might be, um, can educate people as to what the history of these things are, because sometimes I worry that the young, younger generations are so plugged into the future that they forget what we've learned from the past. So um, I, I think that there's an interesting combination where you could bring those things together. But I have a lot of hope for the future, honestly. So we have a question up here. How are you going to fix all of this for us? Um, I just have a question on like, <laughs> <laughs> just, I don't know what to say to that. No, no, I'm it's our turn. <laughs> Um, but earlier you stated that foreign countries have been like posting fake news to, um, sorry, uh, to um, sway Canadian election voting. So do you have a specific example of a foreign country s using um, a news outlet to sway Canadian votes? No, uh, actually I think the biggest involvement of foreign activity in a Canadian election took place in the last election and it wasn't on behalf of the conservatives, it was on behalf of the liberals, and it was the environmental movement that got very, very active, and there's a whole bunch of research that's been done on this, um, and uh, you know, even hiring operatives to go into various communities that they felt were tight elections to mobilize and, and, uh, and assist what they thought were pro-environmental candidates. So yeah, it's happened in Canada before. They've changed the law though, so they can't do that again. Okay, so I'm just going to get a, uh, so I've got one at, the ba one at the far back, this gentleman over here uh, the, the, uh, in the front and then over here. So we'll, let's go to the back first and we're going to swing around this way. Hi, thanks for being here tonight. I have a question. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer it because it might be kind of a vague thing to answer. I'm going to compare it to uh, how much national gross product in dollar figures is lost to people being sitting in traffic jams every year. Has anybody studied how much domestic gross product is lost or how much financial damage is done by the spreading of fake news? Thank you. How much has been done uh, as a result of fake news? I'm sure somebody's done it, but I haven't. So uh, it's an interesting question. Why don't you go on the internet and find out? <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, we have a question over here, please. Uh, sir, just put your hand up again so the usher uh, can see you. Yep, thank you. I just got that. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I, I feel is that where you were talking about the younger people being ahead of us, the old, our generation, the older generation, us 70 year olds, um, 
we got most of our news um, by the written word, so maybe we have a, a tendency to believe it a lot more than the young people. Um, that being said, I recently got a post from my brother that I shared only to find out it was fake news. Trudeau is not getting the UN to come to Toronto, I know. <laughs> But I think that uh, the onus is on all of us, young and old alike, is before we share something, before we post something, is to find out whether it's through Snoops or through Google or through police websites, whether that person that's been posted as a pedophile or that guy who's beating his dog, and you've got a name in front of you to check that name out. Check, there's so many avenues now to check out that news and I think we need to do that. I know that's not a question, but I think that onus is on all of us to double check those facts, that fake news, before we go ahead and believe it. Yeah, we'll take that as a, take that as a comment. Uh, over here, please, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about the propagation of fake news. In fact, any news is not just related to internationalization or globalization, but also to the fact that it's available 24-7, that it's always in people's faces. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Because in the past, people would get their news perhaps from more limited sources, but it would be time limited. Now it's perpetual, it's constant, and it's reinforced. Yeah, no, and that, that's absolutely true. And, and as I said before, 80% of Canadians feel overwhelmed by the amount of information that they've got. Um, they feel overwhelmed by the amount of choice they have. Making choices is a, is a really taxing thing. And it's one of the reasons that, uh, that we do default to these heuristics because they make our, our decision making easier. So information, if you're inundated with it and it really has an emotional appeal to you, will have an effect. There's no doubt about that. Um, over here, we'll come, we'll come, we'll come right back. Yeah, please, sir. Uh, that's me with the red cube. Let her, let her rip, Eric. Okay. Um, a thought, and I hope a question out of it. It was axiomatic during the Cold War. Anybody remember the Cold War? <laughs> it was axiomatic during the Cold War that the man who was easiest to break by counterintelligence or by an intelligence recruitment uh, scheme was the, the educated man who had no deep beliefs. You could turn him. Um, and I, wh when I look at large organizations like Facebook uh, that claim to be free exchanges of data, and I see the owner of one of those saying, I don't have time to go and testify to every government. Uh, if he were hauled up in front of, of Putin's KGB, he would testify. Uh, and um, I wish Dick Fadden were here tonight, but uh, we don't actually have a worldwide internet. We have a Western internet, and the Russians have their internet, and the Chinese have their internet, and day by day we see uh, troubled countries shutting down the internet. It's gone in Kashmir. It's about to go down in Iraq. It went down yesterday. Um, and I wonder to what extent we are fooling ourselves with the neutrality of organizations like Facebook. Yeah, well, and I, th I think there's a lot of people that are asking that question now, and it's why um, various countries are taking action. We asked a question on, uh, on a, and I should put it in the presentation, um, on uh, what people think about governments shutting down social media during a time of a national crisis and there is a surprising amount of support for that, particularly in places that are not well-developed democracies. So uh, I made this comment when we were, uh, which is where I, th that comment came from, um, from those data. Uh, I made that comment during my presentation that what's happening is this idea that things are international is in decline and that people are taking more, con international governments are taking more control over how social media and the internet operates within their, uh, within their domestic environments. The nation state hasn't gone away. In fact, if anything, it's, it's over the space of the last uh, decade, it's been strengthening. 
I think that's a fair observation. Yeah, no, for sure. And there's, I mean, there's, uh, there's a nuance to be had, right? There's the governance of the internet and the, the actual protocols, and then there's the governance on the internet. And the stuff that's been on the internet has been regulated since day one, right? And countries regulate things differently, so that point is not lost. I mean, good example, who's been to the United States before? Who's tried to watch Netflix on their, their account in the United States before? It was way better, right? So we regulate the way the content that, that we see on Netflix in Canada, right? So it is, it, it's something that's been happening since the, since the dawn of time, uh, or since the dawn of the internet, rather. Um, okay, we had a question over here, and uh, there's a question down here as well, too. Oh, we got lots of questions, this is great. So we'll go here, over here, and then up to the front. Yeah, please. Yeah, you had a long list of sources of fake news, but the, uh, the, uh, the cluster, which uh, presents unique problems is social media. Uh, I mean, problems in addressing uh, things. Um, so a two-part question. Firstly, what sort of mechanisms are being discussed for addressing the problem of fake news on social media? Uh, you know, from on a scale of one to 10, 10 being draconian but highly effective, one being, you know, well, nice try. The second part of the question, uh, which of those do you feel uh, are most likely socially and legally to be acceptable and to be a direction that we're likely to see. So I, I actually like the public opinion aspects of this, which are what's the public willing to allow? Because ultimately what the public is willing to support and allow uh, is what the, the opportunity is for government action. And uh, the public is confused on these points. Uh, so on, one, on the one hand, they want very serious efforts by domestic governments to protect privacy. As I told you, the number one threat that people feel in their lives today is being hacked. So they want our security services to be able to deal with that. They feel, interestingly enough, because one, one of the things that we ask them is, what are the biggest sources of threat? And then how well prepared is your government for dealing with it? The one that mo people are most concerned about, that they feel that the government is least prepared to deal with, is being hacked, s cyber threats. Uh, so I think over time what's probably going to ha happen is individual countries uh, on the security level are going to have to develop their capabilities to be able to, uh, to deal with this from a domestic perspective. The other thing that's going to happen, and it's already happening, is that the big tech platforms, uh, the ones that enable all of this, so for example like Facebook, YouTube, um, uh, the um, uh, Google, are going to go through some very traumatic uh, I would say, challenges over the space of the next while as uh, governments. I mean, Elizabeth Warren's already promised if she gets elected and she, she wins the nomination, and if she has a chance of beating Donald Trump, that she's going to break them up. So I think the days of just like the wild west of Silicon Valley and them doing whatever the heck they want and taking no responsibility for the impact of their actions are, are, are pretty much over. As far as the range of governing instruments that you can deal with it, it depends on where you are. So if you're in Hong Kong, they'll shut it down. <laughs> the Chinese government will just shut down the uh, whatever uh, social communications ha they have going on. Eric was mentioning a couple of other examples, but it's also happened in you know, countries that we thought were um, like Thailand, for example, that we wouldn't think that this kind of thing would go on. They've, they've shut down uh, social media and they've sh shut down the internet for the purposes of national security over you know, ver a variety of different incidents. So this is happening all over the world. Uh, and uh, I expect that the, um, the environment that we currently have for social media and, uh, and online activities is going to become more restricted and, uh, and that governments are going to be taking more domestic control over it. We really don't have international agencies that are agreeable to deal with this right now. Uh, there's no international mechanisms. I mean, there's a few agreements and things, but there's no international government in the world. And in a shameless self-promotion for CG, we're actually launching a huge study on this, and there's going to be a series of essays coming out in the next couple of uh, next couple of weeks on this precise point on how we regulate social media companies transnationally. So that's a very good question, sir. Um, over here, please. Yeah. Excellent discussion tonight. Really enjoyed it. I have a question pertaining to uh, south of the border uh, in reference to our Cuba? favorite person. Mexico. <laughs> and uh, controversial issues came up in numerous times, to say the least. And there was always a reference point that they could refer to, and that was the University of Pennsylvania that had a whole department that tried to check facts and figures and questionable situations. 
Is there any such organization in Canada to do the same thing? Uh, I think among the news organizations, they do try to cooperate on that, but the, the, the formal answer is, I would say, that has the ability to just be the ultimate arbiter and judge? No. No. Yes, please. Did you get, a, did you get an a, the answer to the question how we're going to fix all this now? No. No, still not? Okay. You, we're not letting you leave until you do. <laughs> There's like 190 people here who want to know. Yeah. So. Um, so for my other question, uh, do you believe that the belief of fake news, especially in younger people, are a result of cognitive distortion? Cognitive distortions. Uh, so basically, people taking advantage, you know, I, I think I, I basically said I agree, um, that uh, the people who are really good at manipulating understand that what they're doing is they're, it's tribal signaling that relates to people's deepest emotions. So yes, that's exactly what they're doing. Cognitive distortions. You saw the one, the one uh, slide when he put it up. It was uh, that Donald Trump uh, uh, has an executive order banning vaccines, right? right? That's going to provoke an emotional response, right? And so, so that's exactly what they're doing. They're targeting in to, that, to, the, to the part of the brain that's the flight or flight mechanism, so you act instantly without, without, uh, without thinking. Sorry, we had another question? Oh, down here, yeah. Yes. Um, so, first of all, as an educator of high school students, um, I think um, it's completely anecdotal from my own experience, but part of the reason that I believe that younger people um, don't fall for the fake news or the spreading of fake news as much is because, to put it bluntly, they're, they're ignorant of news in general. They don't generally pay attention to the news. Um, when they're sharing I'm shocked, things, shocked. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, when There's gambling at Rick's, oh my God. Yes. So when they're- Older when they're, people get that reference, I know. So. When they're sharing information, they're sharing um, pictures, they're sharing jokes, memes, whatever. They're sharing the, the latest things going on in sports or, uh, or music, what, what have you. Um, so I think that young people may be sort of a, a, a blank slate when they get to a point where they're looking at the news. So in terms of when they get to university or wherever they're going post-secondary or post-high school, um, that's, when, that's when they join into the, the tribalisms of politics. So I think that's a key moment right now in our society in terms of preparing them as they leave secondary and they enter the adult world, where are they gonna latch on? Which ideologies are they gonna latch on to? Um, my question though is um, uh, about nine hours ago on CNN, so I'm assuming it's, it's reputable. It's a very it, specific time, nine hours. Yeah, I, I just checked, it was nine hours ago. Um, I saw it this morning when I was working for school. Anyways, um, there was a court in um, Austria that just granted someone the right, or just granted someone the right because they proved something was liable to force Facebook to take down a posting in another country. They're trying to get them to do that. Um, do you see the courts and libel laws and, and international execution of those laws if, if, to the extent we can do them, do you see that as a possible solution to fake news? People constantly suing even other people who post and repost fake news. Uh, people going after people for posting fake news. And should, do you see that as a slippery slope or do you see that as a possible solution for dealing with it? Yeah, it'd be interesting if there were lawyers in the audience who understand international libel laws, because yeah, they vary from country to country. but. Yeah, the, you know, doing international prosecutions for everything except maybe war crimes, mm -hmm. pretty hard to do. But I, I think, you know, people are really concerned about these, um, these behemoths of, of, uh, of technology and the impact that they've had on society. Um, a lot of good things have happened, but there's a lot of bad things that I think have, uh, have come out of it as well. And uh, the thing that I know is the regulatory environment sometimes sleepy but it, it eventually catches up. The problem that we have on many of these things is that our, our democratic space and our regulatory space does not align with our technological space. So things can be truly global when it comes to something like uh, technology platforms, but they can't be, they're, they're not that way when it comes to things like laws and enforcing laws. So, uh, but at a, at a certain point in time, a consensus starts to form, things start to change, I think we're there now. Interestingly enough, I find the people who tend to lead the most on this are not the American courts. It tends to be the European Union, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, have recently passed a, 
a whole series of data privacy regulations that I know in our company that we have to, uh, we have to deal with. They now have the, uh, the right to be forgotten legislation in Europe where uh, you can get rid of posts of the, from the past that you can remove yourself from, from various types of platforms. You're going to see these things start to spread and other jurisdictions are going to take them on. But I, as I said before, I think that, you know, the Silicon Cowboy idea of like a Mark Zuckerberg, you know, let's, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's break things and, uh, you know, advance or whatever it was that he said. Well, those days are done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I could answer your question because I am an international lawyer who sta understands tr the transnational. I should have shut up. You should have. No, no, I can't. Who understands the transnational application of uh, of libel law? But I'm not going to do it because I don't want the audience to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah. So my question is with um, major tech um, organizations collecting all our personal data. What effect would that, like the fact that they customize what you see and stuff, what effect would that have on the spread of fake news? Oh, I, I mean, that's what the whole Cambridge Analytica thing yeah. was, that they were, be able, they were able to hyper-target based on information that, that Facebook, and this, this is why Facebook got into trouble on this. People, they were selling people's personal information, and they were, were not re disclosing the fact that they were doing it, and these people were buying that information that people that we did not know, not know was commercially available for the purposes of, of uh, running political campaigns and co political uh, social media targeting. So um, uh, I, I, I think that you know, those kinds of things, have, now that they've been revealed, uh, that uh, it, it's definitely happening and that democracies are going to start as slow as they are to take action against it um, because uh, I don't think any of us signed up to have our, our personal data used in that way. Okay, um, so I'm perplexed by some of this data. I don't understand why um, a, a lot of the social media, I, I have to preface by saying I'm not on Facebook, I don't tweet, and I've never shared any articles um, from the internet with people. And you live under a bridge where? Yes, and <laughs> I, I live in a cave, I teach political science. But anyhow, so, my question is... That, well, that Plato, of course, maybe is I in a clave. I'm 59 years old. So what I don't understand is why would people of my generation in their 50s and 60s and 70s be sharing stories from sources that are not what I would consider legitimate sources of news, where there's an ombudsman that is attached to that publication, where the publication is well known, that you know that the authors are going to be vetted. I mean, what is being shared exactly? I, I, I'm really confused on what, it, what kind of, does it, is it like the daily news and from Minnesota and they're gonna share that when they don't even know if that uh, newspaper exists? I just find that strange that my generation would be fooled by things like that or would even consider those sources as possible sources. So that's one question I have. The second piece is related to this, and I, I wonder, Daryl, if we, in my view, we are in a moment where expertise is devalued, and that is across every platform, whether it's medicine, you know, you go to your doctor and you, your doc, you come to your doctor and tell them what drug they should give you, right, because you saw it on the internet or on TV or so on, instead of the doctor being the person who it knows this information and should probably give you some, some advice, right? And I think it's across all these different areas. So if everybody considers themselves now an expert in all kinds of things, because they're just gonna look it up or whatever, and now they feel they have that authority, then does that make them more likely also to be fooled by all kinds of news that they might read, right? Because they have this confidence, which I don't think my ge uh, the generation prior had. We really look to the doctor or to the to the to the expert, um, and so on and so forth. So I wonder if that's well a factor. No, I, 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 you've asked a really good question. And I'd like to spend just a couple minutes uh, answering just like three or four parts because you've really hit a you've really hit an important thing. Um, as as far as people being um, educated and being able to deal with this. We, we've already demonstrated, I think I did with these data, that there's no correlation between your le level of education and the likelihood of, uh, of being fooled, as, as Aaron was for a brief time. 
Uh, and if you were plugged into those platforms, the likelihood that you would be fooled is there too. These are really well done examples. <laughs> I mean, the, the way that they put it out is, uh, is um, it, 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 it's, a, it's the sort of thing that you look at it and you, th you think it might be true, right? I mean, it's not, it's not that it's, uh, you know, um, uh, done in an amateurish way. They're very professionally done. So I, I think if you were in that space, that the chance would be that you would get fooled too, because most people are. And there's no correlation between level of knowledge, education, self-confidence, anything, uh, in terms of your likelihood to be fooled. We're all fooled. Um, the uh, issue of deference in science and expertise is a very interesting question for me, uh, because they really are under challenge, as you as you said, and the decline of deference, and, and what I mean by that is the willingness of people to challenge authority has never been this high. And the reason for that is we have the most literate population we've ever had in any way that you can measure it. We have the most educated population we've ever had in any way that you can measure it. And we've told them to be critical thinkers. So why should we be surprised that they're critical? Why should we be surprised that they are prepared to take on what should be authorities based on the information that they believe they have access to, that they believe is factual. So um, uh, you combine that type of a population all over the world <coughs> with the entire history of human knowledge, you're gonna get challenges. People are gonna feel like they're prepared to be able to take on experts, and experts are going to be under fire. Uh, why we, this is the situation that we've created as a result of all of this. Much of it is very positive, but some of it is negative. But the other side I would have to say about this is the way that experts have devolved, too. And, they, and I use the word devolved very specifically and carefully. I think part of the problem is that when we bring science to politics, we don't make politics more scientific, we make science more political. And what I'm saying about this is there are a lot of people who now stand up and talk about scientific facts. And I'll give you a great example. I just wrote a book on this called Empty Planet that I spoke about here in, um, in, uh, in Waterloo last, I guess, March or whatever. It was March, wasn't it? March or April? April? April. We got snowed out the first time, anyway. <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to Canada. Um, but uh, so I spent a lot of time, I wrote a book with John Ebbotson about world population prospects. It's not as boring as it sounds. Uh, and it's about th the idea that the UN has put out there that by the year 2100, that we're going to have a population of 11.2 billion people on this earth, completely unsustainable, uh, and that we have to do something dramatic to restrict the growth of the human population. But when you actually sit down and look at the data, much of it the UN's own data, there's no way we're gonna get to 11.2 billion people. No way. And they know it. And they know it. But they continue to go out and talk about this because they're so um, focused on um, dealing with, say, for example, overpopulation in a place like Africa that they feel they have to tell everybody else that they have to control the population, uh, you know, the, pr the production of their own families. We had, uh, you know, uh, um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle come out and take the two-kid challenge. Well, that's a great idea, except the birth rate in the UK is 1.8. <laughs> and by the way, global population fertility is collapsing rapidly. We're probably going to reach a, a, a time in this century, probably 2050, 2060, in which the global population is going to peak out at about 8.5 billion and start to decline, and how far down it's going to go, we don't even know. The problem has already been dealt with because nobody's having kids. Uh, how many of you have two brothers and sisters? <laughs> a lot of you. And, and he's, his expertise is in polling, too, so that's legit. Yeah, two brothers. By that, no, but uh, that I mean, do you, do, you have, uh, do you have three kids in your family? Yeah, a few of you do. <laughs> a few of you do. You're very productive. Well, that's uh, <laughs> because the birth rate in Canada today is 1.5. They're from Cambridge. They're from Cambridge. <laughs> we don't have a lot to do from Cambridge. I'm from Cambridge, so it's... Um, but the uh, birth rate in Canada today is 1.5. That means that every Canadian woman in her lifetime has 1.5 kids. To have a, a, just a sustaining population, you need to have a birth rate of 2.1. We don't have it. 
So the Canadian population without immigration and without aging would be shrinking today. I'm the first person who's told you that. Because we have all of these scientists running around because there's, you know, well, we're all concerned about global warming, which we all are. We're all concerned about a whole bunch of topics that were basically serious topics back in the 1960s and 70s, but have already been dealt with, but we've built all these programs to continue dealing with them. So we have to continue to go out there and continue to scare people about what's going to happen in the world when they know the evidence is completely to the contrary. So what the problem is, is this is when we bring science to politics, is you just make science political. And, and uh, uh, the problem I have with a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of people who get very political on the scientific front these days is they believe that their agenda is so important that we can sort of shave the truth. We can, we can do the thing that, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, scientists were never supposed to do because the ends are supposed to be justified, and that's to challenge. And that's to say I may have doubts. I'm, you know... 99% of the time this is going to happen, but I really need to focus on the 1%. We don't do that anymore. Now we're advocates. Sci scientists are advocates. So you've got a combination of all of these people who have access to all of this information. They no longer trust the way that they used to. Combined with people who are on the other side of this, who are supposed to be the people telling the truth, in many instances who have their own political agendas, no wonder we're in the situation that we're in. And I can only use that one ex you know, sp specific example of the UN and p their population statistics to, to tell you that this happens <laughs> all the time. Whenever I hear anybody say that you know, all, of these, all the scientists in the world agree to something, that's not science, that's ideology. Surely there must be a few that are credible that happen to disagree with some aspect of it because that's the scientific process. We're supposed to disagree. That's how we advance science. Hypothesis, antithesis, uh, synthesis, we, we continue that this, this process of educating and learning. We don't stop. <coughs> so I, I recognize the, you know, the importance of some political agendas, but um, the reason that you create doubt is because the scientists compromise this independence for the purposes of making a political point. So you know, I, think, I think there's all sorts of bad that's going on in all of this, and it's no wonder that we end up in this situation. So we are now entering the lightning round uh, of, our of our conversation. So yes, real quick question no, here. No, yes. Question, and quick question here. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, I have two questions. Um, you get one. <laughs> one actually, sorry, uh, 1.5. I believe you mentioned uh, Jonathan Haidt earlier when you were speaking. And right now our class is reading The Coddling of the American Mind, which you co-authored. Mm -hmm. And Great so book. you talk about the three untruths specifically on college campuses. And you've already mentioned two of them in depth being emotional reasoning and tribalism. And so the third one they talk about is fragility and how people tend to run away from ideas that challenge their beliefs. And so I was just wondering what, how you feel that would affect the propagation of fake news. I'm well, assuming this is an advanced class. Yes, this is <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. I, 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 you know, I, I think that uh, um, that's a good question. I, I actually see number two and number three as being kind of linked. Yeah. Tribalism and the other element that you were just mentioning is uh, I think they're they're pretty much linked and this is this idea that uh, we think that everybody else is in a bubble is isn't, isn't open minded and in fact we're in our own bubbles we perceive other people to be in those bubbles the biggest bubbles I see the tightest bubbles these days tend to be on a lot of on a lot of college campuses and it's caused a lot of problems it's not it's not pleasant being a university professor these days um, okay so we have our last question over here you have the answer for us go ahead. Um, actually, that's what I wanted to discuss. Um, so your question, I believe, was how is my generation going to stop the uh, reoccurring fake news? Is that it? Yep. Um, so it kind of goes back to the coddling. People are short-term thinkers, and so we are exposed to these kind of fake news on a lower level when we're little. When um, something doesn't go our way on a playground, we can make up a rumor about someone, and then that's kind of the same idea. Whereas when a fake news is spread around, it's based on someone's emotion, I believe. So it kind of all relates back to people, when they're exposed to it young, they become fragile. <laughs> and until we are able to become anti-fragile and until we are able to um, erase that exposure from young children, I don't believe that fake news will ever um, discontinue. I believe that it's set in stone and people will just have to become better at noticing things that aren't real. Well, there's always been fake news, let's be clear. 
I mean, we've always been telling rumors. I mean, I'm hearing all sorts of rumors, for example, about various things of nefarious things that have happened in the various political campaigns and things that are going to come out or whatever. There's always, the, we call it the rumor mill. The problem is the, 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 the rumor mill has now found a global environment. Uh, and uh, the people who are putting out the rumors are, are not just, you know, doing it for their own entertainment. They're actually trying to have an effect. So, yeah, I think it's part of human nature. Uh, so, uh, two quick uh, housekeeping notes before we adjourn for the evening. On October 22nd, we're going to be screening a film here uh, called Black Code, uh, which follows cyber stewards from Toronto's, uh, Toronto's based uh, Citizen Lab. So, they're, what they do is they go out and they expose digital espionage around the world. So, October 22nd, right, that, right here, Black Code. Uh, we do serve popcorn, so there'll be popcorn. So, uh, come and check that out. And then on November 7th, we have Lieutenant General Christopher Coates from NORAD, who's going to be talking about how NORAD is, uh, is uh, evolving at a rapidly changing threatscape. So without further ado, please uh, join me in wel welcoming our speaker, or thanking our speaker uh, uh, for what was really, I, I would say, just an insightful, engaging, uh, and wonderful conversation. Thank you very Thank much, Daryl.